So the next stage for me when designing these circuits, uh, where I am thinking them through before I actually build them, is not just to jump onto the breadboard and start plugging chips in and wires. That's quite a nice way to do it when, when you're not quite sure what you're doing and you're making it up as you go along. But when I've thought things through a bit more like this, uh, I like to actually use the computer tools to design the circuit a bit more. Um, and in order to do that, I assign all the footprints using the footprint assignment tool here. Um, and then I go into the PCB view, so let's have a look at that. So here we are in the PCB editor and you can see what I've done here. I've imported all of the footprints from the schematic editor in the usual way. Uh, that's using this button up here, update the PCB with changes made to the schematic. That ensures that uh, the data being presented here exactly matches the circuit that was designed in the schematic editor. Note in this case I didn't actually finish designing that circuit, there were a lot of things that were kind of tacitly assumed to be connected to power or ground. Um, that doesn't really matter here because we're not actually making a PCB, but we are going to use this to help us to plan the layout on the breadboard. So I lined up the top row here according to how I'd built the transmit circuit. I didn't actually do this ahead of making the transmit circuit, so the wires and things aren't all drawn on there, but this, the chips are in the same order I put them on that circuit, and I left the gap here where I put those resistors in, for example. Um, so it's representative of, of what's this, what was in that circuit there. Um, and then down here I've laid out the chips for the receive circuit. Now when these come in, uh, the, the connections between them are only drawn as uh, rat's nest lines, these are called, which uh, basically joins together pins that are meant to be connected. I can actually highlight a net if I, if I press that button there, that's the back tick button. Um, this pin here is connected to that pin there, or should be, in the schematic editor it's connected, and it should also be connected to that one over there. So uh, you you should turn on the option to have bendy lines for these, otherwise they all, line, they all lie on top of each other all the time. But this just gives you an idea of how connected things are together, and the first thing you're doing, just like when you're laying out a PCB, is you're looking at which things are connected to each other, which things have quite a lot of connections to each other, and maybe thinking a little bit about uh, which things need to be near each other because they have high frequency traces and thing, uh, high, high frequency signals and things like that. For breadboard work, I haven't actually found many problems with high frequency signals over long distances, except in some specific cases like the the pixel clock for VGA. I had some problems with wiring that from one side of a board to another one just because I hadn't thought it through beforehand and I had to do some uh, resistor termination of that one to sort out some bouncing when I was doing my sprite circuit. You might remember that one from that video. But mostly I don't think too much about that. I sort of try to keep things together when they have high frequency signals but um, I, I don't go out of my way particularly on that one on breadboards. Um, what I tend to do because I really hate doing lots of long distance wiring is just try and keep things together if they have a lot of connections between them. So the first thing I did here for the receive circuit uh, was basically try and find a, find an ordering of these chips so that they could all go, go in one row on a breadboard and not have too many long connections from one end of the row to the other. So um, when I bring these in originally, they would have looked more like these ones with just rat's nest lines between them. But as you can see here, it's pretty hard to tell which pins are connected to each other when all the rat's nest lines are just going in one long line like this. Um, you, can, uh, you can highlight them to, uh, to sort of find out more which ones are connected to each other. Uh, but visually, it's not very helpful. So what I then do is actually pretend I'm making a PCB out of this, but with the geometry of a breadboard. Uh, the red lines here represent uh, mostly uh, breadboard columns which are which are internally connected within the breadboard uh, and the blue lines represent the uh, the physical wire connections the point to point connections that i am going to need to make on the breadboard to get these pins connected so i can't, i don't draw all the red lines and sometimes i do i mean you can you you can you can basically copy and paste these so if i copy that line and paste it on this pin for example um KiCad's smart enough to relabel it from RDRF to TX stop at that point because it knows it's not connected to RDRF anymore and it's connected to TX stop. So you can kind of do that, and and you know you can do you can do two at a time as well. Um, that that all works too. So there are methods you can use to uh, fill in more of these red lines. I haven't bothered in this case for larger projects. I have done that. Um, 
because it makes it a little bit easier to do the, do the blue lines afterwards. But the real point of this is the blue lines because the blue lines then give me a very clear visual guide when I'm building this circuit on the breadboard about which pins need to connect to each other. After that my strategy is mostly to uh, build the circuit on the breadboard by, add, by, by first of all putting all the ICs in, then I build a ground network um, and I connect all the power and ground pins to the to the power rails. I also often connect the ground pins back up to the upper ground rail as well, just to provide a bit more of a grid ground, because that tends to reduce uh, signal quality issues if you do it that way. Certainly for the fast PDIP breadboard computer, um, that was how I did that one. Really hard to tell whether it made a difference or not because by the time you know that the system's working you can't really go back and unplug all these wires because they're right at the bottom of my build but I certainly didn't want to be adding those afterwards so I added those right from the start on that one. Um, it really depends how, how important I think signal integrity is going to be. But anyway, after connecting all the power and ground pins, uh, I then need to actually start wiring things together. And I usually approach that just by going all the way along one of the rows in order and um, connecting the chip, first of all, where, where necessary to itself. Things like this connection between uh, the top and bottom rows of this chip, I'll put a bridge in for those. Um, and then I work along the row and I tend to kind of do it backwards. I, I, I go in both directions sometimes actually, but I either connect this chip to all of the other ones in the row it needs to be connected to, or I connect all the other ones to it by by basically working along the row and then only making connections to the left. Anything you do that's methodical will help here because you don't want to miss any connections. It just helps you to be sure that you've done everything correctly. It's also really easy having this uh, visualization in the PCB editor uh, to to kind of zoom in and just get the local view of what things ought to look like around the chip. It's like which of its pins are meant to be connected. Are any of them just not connected at all? Is that Are they meant to be not connected? Um, have you missed anything? And things like this one are a little bit more difficult because that's potentially connected to a lot of other things. So on the breadboard that might not look quite the same overall. But at least it's still there to give you the uh, the option to just go through all the pins of the IC and just mentally check it's meant to be connected to all of these other ones, can I trace the wires on the breadboard to ensure that it actually is? But that's if you're feeling methodical. You don't have to be methodical about it. I try to for larger circuits and I do tend to find that that means a lot of these circuits actually work first time after I build them, which is quite satisfying. It's not necessary, you can obviously diagnose them afterwards, but the less diagnosis you need to do the better. I also do the cross row connections after finishing the entire row, so I tend to just leave them off completely until I've done the whole row, and then I come back and it's fairly easy on this uh, PCB editor view to identify the ones that do go between rows. It'll be those ones, it'll be these ones that I didn't even bother drawing in here, that you can, only, you can just see in the rat's nest here. So all of those, I'll come back and uh, basically make those connections afterwards. Anyway, I, I wanted to run you guys through this because I have found this process of using the PCB editor as a tool for laying out breadboards to be particularly effective. And while we're at it, here's a um, more advanced example, I guess. This is the breadboard layout for the uh, fast PDIP 6.2 computer I built. Um, and for this one, I definitely did want to design the layout in KiCad before actually committing it to the breadboard. I didn't want to be finding my way through that. Um, I was particularly interested in how close I could get the CPU and RAM and, and various control circuitry to be around there. Uh, the rest of this is the I.O. module, which doesn't matter as much. I'm aware I haven't talked you guys through how this circuit works in detail. Um, I did post some links to um, other pages in the description of the last video and I will come back and do a proper series of videos about um, the design and construction of this circuit because I think there's quite a lot of people interested in that. But yeah, using the PCB editor to, to plan the breadboard layout was really valuable here and you can see here I actually used the blue side of the board uh, for the breadboard connections and I didn't bother in this case drawing on the uh, the, the, the wires that connect them together because on a circuit this large and complex 
the difficulty with doing that stuff in KiCad is that you can't make those red wires overlap each other if you start using them. So you can do things like uh, configure KiCad to be making a four layer board or a six layer board or something like that. Then you get a lot more colors to use, but it loses the uh, the, the visual immediacy uh, that, that I had in the uh, serial circuit I showed you before. And it's kind of not worth the effort. I've done it before, but I, and, and it, it it, I don't think it was really worth well, worth the effort. So in this case, I used KiCad to help me lay things out, and I drew all the blue lines on because that makes the rat's nest point to the ends of the lines instead of to the actual pins on the chips, and I found that a little bit more more readable. It means that the connections um, to, to other things on the same row tend to be at the bottom of the lines, whereas the, uh, the cross-row connections are at the top, although it's not entirely consistent with that. Um, but I, yeah, I just used the rat's nest to do this, and in particular the highlighting functionality where you can click on a pin and find out what other pins it's meant to be connected to. But yeah, just another example of using KiCad's PCB editor to help design a circuit, and in particular to make sure the thing you build on the breadboard actually matches your schematic.